chemistries. And horizontally, you're gradually increasing uh, the number of protons and electrons and, and changing that chemistry. OK, um, the other interesting thing about the periodic table is it's a bit like uh, Shetlands on the map of the UK. There's this chunk down here called the F block elements, and they fit into this space. But unfortunately, if you slot them into that space, then the whole thing gets too wide and too hard to see. So they get pulled out, and stuck on one side, just like the Shetlands are always dragged in closer to the rest of the UK in any map that you see in an atlas. In the 20th century, we've come to understand why the shape is like it is. You know, what, what is going on? Why do we have these structures? And it's all to do with the electron orbitals and the quantum mechanics of the atoms. But this was created entirely by observation. People looked at the properties of elements and worked out the patterns. And to that extent, it's a bit like uh, zoology, biology, where things were classified first by looking at similar features, you know, fur, not fur, structure of the bones, things like this, um, number of petals in the flower. And they, they were organized in that way. And then later we were able to do DNA analysis and, and understand why those structures were the way they were. All of these elements here, the, uh, so from um, 104 upwards and this here, 95 to 90 to 103, these are all um, unstable. They've never been seen in the universe, only in laboratories. So all of these elements were created in laboratories. And it's a, a kind of weird process because essentially you, you, you bang two heavy nuclei together and hope that you create a new element that way. And it's a bit like um, loading a cannon with, with, with cake and firing and, and custard and firing it uh, at a, a, a bowl of jelly and expecting to get a perfect trifle. Um, it, you know, these is very, very difficult. The, the, the nuclei are quite floppy and you have to bang them in together at precisely the right energy in order to make them stick. But you can make these things. Not much of them. Organesson, which is the latest one added in 2016. Uh, five atoms of this have definitely been made. And there is a report of a sixth atom having been made. So we don't know very much about this stuff. Um, so anyway, these are not seen in the universe, not seen in nature. So we'll get rid of those and we won't talk about those anymore. We'll talk about the rest. These ones here are the metals. OK, the ones that are not shaded are metals. They're typically shiny uh, electrical conductors. They have weakly bound electrons so that the, the atoms kind of sit in an electron soup. The electrons can move around very easily and makes them conductors. Um, the only thing I'd add is that whatever you do, whatever classification scheme you come up with, um, then hydrogen is always weird. Uh, so it acts most of the time like a nonmetal. Um, but it is reputed that if you could compress it to very, very high densities, sort of thing you'd find uh, towards the core of Jupiter, then you would actually, it would actually become metallic. Um, but generally it gets treated as a non-metal. So all these are metals. Most of the periodic table are metals. These are the non-metals. These are, the electrons are tightly bound. Uh, they are insulators, so they are not conducting. And then... These ones here, this little group down here, these are the semiconductors. They can swing both ways. And because they can be made to be either insulators or conductors, they're the basis of electronics. The ones highlighted here in red, these are the bulk elements of life. This is what most of our bodies are made out of, our proteins, our bones, our brains, our blood, all made out of mostly out of these elements. And then there's another group of elements, which are trace elements needed by various forms of life, but in much smaller amounts. Uh, so for example, if we take copper, um, an average healthy adult will have about a tenth of a gram of copper in their body. It's not very much, 
But if they don't have it, they will die because certain critical enzymes depend on having copper there to make them work. Uh, so various other interesting ones. So copper and zinc are found together in a, an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which is critical for removing oxygen free radicals from the body. So it's all about preventing damage to the cells arising from our, our metabolism, keeping us healthy. Um, there's another dismutase which uses manganese and iron. Iron, of course, is found in uh, blood. Uh, that gives it the red color, the hemoglobin. But um, octop octopus, for example, uses copper to carry uh, the oxygen in its blood, uh, various solutions. Vanadium is a slightly odd one. Um, it's found in very high amounts in the blood of certain sea squirts, um, but we don't know why. Uh, it seems to be not for carrying oxygen, although it could, but we don't know what it's doing there. But again, the sea squirts get deficient in vanadium, they tend to die. Molybdenum is another critical element involved in a variety of biological processes. Most interesting one being the enzyme nitrogenase, which is how nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of leguminous plants work. So this vitally important process of taking nitrogen from the atmosphere, converting it into nitrate, getting it into uh, the soil as a natural fertilizer. It's why we grow clover um, and why we grow leguminous plants to make sure that the molybdenum in the nitrogenase is fixing the nitrogen and keeping the soil healthy. Uh, just a point that francium, technetium and astatine have no stable isotopes. So they exist, they can be made, but they fall apart quite quickly. So for example, francium has a half-life of 22 minutes. It's a breakdown product of uranium, which is found naturally on the earth. So uranium is radioactive, the radioactive part breaks apart, it fissions, francium is one of the uh, side products of that process. And there's about a couple of grams of that on the earth at any one time. So it hasn't vanished completely, it continues to be made, but it doesn't last very long. And this is the book of our material world. This is what we make the world out of. This is how we construct everything. And if you're interested in individual elements and their individual properties, I recommend on YouTube, there's a channel called Periodic Videos, and it's led by this wonderful character, Professor Sir Martin Polyakov, who has the best scientific hair that I have ever seen. Um, and he's got loads of videos on each of the elements and being a good chemist, as far as possible, he demonstrates them by setting fire to things, blowing them up or creating clouds of smoke. So that's good fun to do. We use just about all of the periodic table. You may not be familiar with all these names, but we use a lot of it. Two thirds of the periodic table alone is used in the mobile phone. So what is the history of the elements? Uh, again, just for definition, uh, an element is material that can't be broken down into anything simpler using readily available methods. So heat, acid, electricity, solvents, anything like that. So anything short of putting it into an atom smasher or a nuclear reactor, it's going to stay there. Um, so elements are the, were the simplest things for most of the history of mankind. And these ones highlighted in red, these are the ones we knew in prehistory. Uh, they were all either fine lying about or the, on the ground were fairly easy to get out of ores. So copper, Silver, gold can be found as native nuggets. Um, iron, of course, uh, for the Iron Age. Tin and lead, very important quite early on. Tin and going with copper for bronze. And then some interesting things like mercury, which comes out very readily by heating a, a mineral called cinnabar. And mercury just oozes out as a silvery liquid. And that was fascinating to uh, early researchers and the alchemists became obsessed with mercury and its strange properties. And they often saw that as a way of converting base metals into gold. And mercury was this kind of in-between strange material. 1750, and we haven't made much progress. We've only added a few elements to our knowledge. Um, this is an interesting one, phosphorus. Phosphorus was discovered by a guy called Henning Brand in 1669. Uh, he was an alchemist 
and he went through the fortunes of two wives in search of the philosophers of stone. Uh, he just burned through all their money, all their dowry, looking for the philosophers of stone. And for some reason, at some point, presumably in 1668, 69, he decided that a really smart thing to do would be to get hold of 5,500 liters of stale urine, allow it to stand until it had putrefied, boil it to a solid, and then distill what he could get out of that. And from that, he actually distilled phosphorus with its unearthly glow. But you've got to admit, I mean, this guy would be the neighbor from hell. Five and a half thousand liters of putrefying urine being distilled. And this is the scene as imagined by Joseph Wright in 1771 in this famous painting of the alchemist. And there's Henning Brand in awe of what he has created. And his two assistants appear to be deeply uninterested in what he's found. Um, but that's the story of one of the elements, one of the few that were discovered in that period from prehistory up until 1750. Move forward to 1850, another 100 years, and we have the explosion of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, and that filled in a lot of gaps. So we now have much more of the periodic tables we see it today is filled in. And all kinds of things were going on. Now, people like Humphrey Davy, who said, nothing tends so much to the advancement of knowledge as the application of a new instrument. Uh, and he meant it. He was prolific. Uh, he worked at the Royal Institution in London, and he picked up on the work of Luigi Galvani on animal electricity and Alessandro Volta with the battery, took their ideas. From that, he developed electric chemistry. And in 1807 to 1808, he discovered eight new elements and proved that chlorine was an element. He may have discovered iodine as well, but there's a bit of a priority dispute about that. Um, he also developed the electric arc and incandescent lighting. So he was a fairly busy bunny. These are not the only things he did. He did, he was sort of a Renaissance man. Uh, he was a poet. He was a friend of Robert Southey and Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Um, and together they had laughing gas parties. Uh, they were really excited by inhaling this intoxicant gas and, and all the fun they could have with that. Uh, very decadent. Um, and he kept experimenting. At one uh, famous occasion, he inhaled experimentally four quarts of carbon monoxide, um, nearly died, managed to drag himself out of the house where he was onto the lawn and lay on the lawn measuring his pulse rate and recording the symptoms of this deeply unpleasant experience. Um, and from that, he decided that the buzz you got from carbon monoxide was no fun at all, and it's better to stick with good old laughing gas. Uh, he was involved in the Royal Institution lectures. Uh, it was very popular and exciting and often dangerous lectures that were carried out, enlightenment and entertainment. And this is an 1802 Gilray cartoon uh, called The New Discovery in Pneumatics. And this is actually, where is he? Humphrey Davy is here uh, with this rather ominous looking uh, device. Not quite sure what he's going to do with that. Um, but this was this fat period of fascination with new developments and understanding what could be done. And of course, he invented the Davy lamp, uh, fire, uh, uh, miner's safety lamp. Uh, interestingly, there's another priority dispute there. He was fairly disputatious character. George Stevenson also claimed to have invented the safety lamp. And I'm told that right through to the end of mining in the Northeast, uh, it was described as a Stevenson lamp and not a Davy lamp. Davy's assistant was Michael Faraday, and maybe he was even more important. He took Davy's electrical work forward and developed electric motors, dynamos, and electromagnets. And he was also a communicator. He set up the Christmas lectures in 1825 that are still running today. If you see them on Channel 4 every Christmas, sets of lectures for young people, showing them science, getting them excited. Um, and he was a remarkable communicator. On one occasion, he did a course of six lectures, six one-hour lectures on the chemical history of a candle flame, just taking a simple candle flame and explaining everything that was going on in terms of the understanding of physics and chemistry at the time. Uh, and if you're interested, again, that is also on, on YouTube, not by him, but recreated by an American professor a few years ago. 
so here we are in 1850. We've got a lot of elements, got the majority of the elements, but we have no structure. We have no logic. And people are trying all, all kinds of ways to arrange the elements, to help memory and to show the relationships between the elements. It was clearly something going on here. You know, you could, could match up elements that had similar properties, but nothing seemed to really explain what was going on. And along comes Dmitry Mendeleev. Now he's the professor of chemistry at St. Petersburg University. And he's trying to write a textbook on chemistry for undergraduates. Now, any of you who've had any engagement with undergraduates taking first year chemistry, they really need something simple if they're gonna remember any of it. You know, a lot of them, I used to teach first year uh, medics the chemistry they needed and they really weren't interested. That's not what they were there for. Uh, so you need to make it simple. So he's trying to find a table or a pattern he can put into this textbook that will make sense of this. So he writes out all the properties of the elements that are known onto decks of cards and he sort of lays them out in patterns. He plays chemical patients. He does this obsessively um, night after night. And the legend is that the, the final structure came to him in a dream. Um, I'm slightly doubtful about this because basically everybody who has a really weird idea tends to claim that it came to them in a dream, which means it's easier to kind of backtrack if it turns out not to be right. But anyway, he claimed he had this vision and saw it in a dream and started to write down a structure. And this is in 1869, the very first sketch of a periodic table. And it's on the back of an invitation for him to come and inspect a cheese factory. So this kind of is hard to understand, but by the time we get to 1871, it started to look more like the periodic table we understand. And if you look particularly at this bit down here and kind of turn that through 90 degrees, that will start to look like the periodic table we're familiar with. But as I say, lots of people were trying to make patterns, trying to create an understanding. So what is it about Mendeleev? Why not any of the others? And his genius, his real contribution was prediction. He saw that for his pattern to work, there were gaps. There were elements which had not yet been discovered, which would be necessary to complete his pattern. So everyone else was trying to make a table out of the elements that were known and not leaving any gaps. And so he said, scandium, gallium, germanium, technetium, these would exist. And he described their properties. He said what uh, chemistry they ha would have, what kind of atomic weight they would have, what density they would have, would they be metals or non-metals? And he described them very accurately. And that's really what eventually sold people on the, uh, the Mendeleev form of the periodic table that we know today, it was the fact that it was predictive. Unfortunately, he was proposed for the Nobel Prize in 1906, was approved by the Chemistry Committee, but was then blocked by the main committee. And that's because he'd got into a, another one of his dis, these scientific disputes with a guy called Svante Arrhenius, who was hugely influential uh, in Scandinavian science and in the European science in general. Um, and, and he blocked Mendeleev getting the Nobel Prize, which was, was very sad, basically because he said that he'd just put together the obvious facts and hadn't actually demonstrated any science at all. He'd just come up with a way of, of, of drawing a table, which is slightly unfair because of the predictions. So he never gets the Nobel Prize. Um, Svante Arrhenius is an interesting character because he's one of the first people to start seriously working on the problem of global warming and predicting that global warming would happen if we kept using coal. So an interesting character in his own right. One last story about the elements before we move on to the astronomy bit. Um, this is the small village of Utterby on an island in the Stockholm archipelago. And it has seven elements named after this tiny village. Why? Here they are. There's yttrium, there's erbium, there's ytterbium. Um, at that point, Terbium, they've, they've run out of syllables. They've used all the syllables you can use from Utterby. So we also have Holmium, which is named after Stockholm, Thulium, which is named after the mythical land of the north, and Gadolinium, named after Johann Gadolin, who was the scientist who discovered most of these, who separated them. 
Um, and they all come from some odd rocks in this small mine in the later 19th century. They weren't looking for metals, they were mining feldspar. So what did they need feldspar for? So we need to wind the clock back to 1700. Johann Friedrich Botger is not the prosperous burger we see here, but an 18 year old apothecary's apprentice. And he's an alchemist in his spare time and claims to be able to make gold. It's not clear why the, his master, the, the master apothecary didn't question why if he could make gold, he was busy sweeping out the apothecary shop. But anyway, he claimed he could make gold. Frederick I of Prussia is very keen on gold. And so he arrests uh, Botka. Um, this was because Frederick I had been stung by alchemists previously who'd leached on him for years at a time and not produced gold. So he tended to arrest them, sling them in a jail and insist that they make gold right now. Uh, this was a dangerous position for Botka. So he escapes to Saxony, helped by the Elector of Saxony, Augustus II, who arranges for him to be rescued and then promptly arrests him and says, now make gold for me. And he spends three years in a dungeon lab. He escapes, he's recaptured, he's threatened with execution, he's not executed yet. Um, and the court mathematician of Saxony, uh, Ehrenfried Walter von Schoenhaus, is set to oversee his work. Um, and basically, uh, Augustus gives him a deadline, you've got eight days, make something interesting, or that's it. So what to do? Um, but von Schoenhaus has been working on another problem, which was how do you make what's called white gold, which is porcelain. At that point, that was the uh, preserve of the Chinese and was very expensive and in great demand in Europe. So there's a great search for what's called white gold. Can we make, can we get the recipe for porcelain? And von Schoenhaus has been working on this in his spare time. So he gets together with Botka and they work away and they come up with a solution. They come up with a practical recipe using feldspar, which will make porcelain. At this point, round of applause from everybody. Everyone's going to be made a baron this and given pensions and everything. Von Schoenhaus dies. Um, and then there's some very dubious dealings with Botka and the executor who rush round to von Schoenhaus' uh, apartments and grab all of his notes and um, kind of make away with the secret. Uh, and so Botka becomes known as the person who invented porcelain, uh, but it's probably not him. It's probably von Schoenhaus as much as anything, but it leads to the creation of the Meissen factory in 1713, and feldspar is a key ingredient of European porcelain, and so everyone's looking for it, and so you end up searching for mines that can provide you with feldspar, and hence the story of Utterby. And of course, in Meissen, we have some of the most hideous ceramics known to history, and that leads directly, of course, to the Antiques Roadshow. So that's the history of the elements on Earth, but where does all this stuff come from? We've gone through the beauty and importance of the periodic table, we haven't answered the question. So it's April 1961. A six year old boy is inspired to become a spaceman, obsessed, anything to do with space. And in fact, my rotten mother and my aunt, um, my mother used to prepare a fairly repellent soup of pearl barley and minced beef and onions that I, I really detested. But they, between them, convinced me that this was well known as spaceman soup. And this is what all space people tra uh, trained on. So I ate it with gusto after that. And I still haven't forgiven them. So I decide to be prepared for the interview for the space program by knowing all about space. And that leads me to astronomy. Uh, I'm living in London. London is not great. I have a fairly narrow view from the back garden, lots of light pollution. So I got pretty good at the Summer Triangle and Orion, but that, that was about it. But I was always enthralled by the immensity of it. You know, the, the, the sheer scale, the sun is big. It would hold one million Earths. If the sun was a dot on an eye on a paperback page, our galaxy, the Milky Way, would be as big as the Earth. It's 100,000 light years across, 
and has about 250 billion stars. It's kind of hard to tell because we're inside it, but it's probably about 250 billion stars. And you can go more than that. Remember the Hubble Extreme Deep Field? That's a two arc minute square image. It contains 5,550 galaxies. If that kind of density was repeated across the sky, and there's no reason to see why it shouldn't be, there will be 180 billion galaxies visible from Earth with the Hubble telescope pointed everywhere. 60% of them are more than 9 billion years old, and some of them are over 12 billion years old. So we're looking at immense history of the universe. And the universe is filled with, we know, with gas clouds and with the galaxies. And those were two of my own images, so I thought I'd get them in to show that I very occasionally can do uh, astrophotography. So we know all those elements are out there, but how do we know all this about the composition of stars? And the answer is spectroscopy. If a material, an element is heated to a high enough temperature or excited in some other way, then the electrons in it get boosted to higher energy levels. And then when they fall back down to a more stable energy level, they give off a particular photon of light, a particular wavelength. So this is sodium, all seen salt when it gets into the flame of the gas cooker, and copper, and of course, all the other colors that we see in fireworks come from the excitation of those particular elements. And you can see that in spectra as well. So this is the spectrum of the sun. And here we're looking at very, very bright white light, if you like, behind an atmosphere that contains elements. And so instead of seeing the emission of those particular lines, we're seeing the absorption. We see the dark lines because elements in specific spaces uh, specific energy levels, and they're absorbing particular photon energies, particular wavelengths of light, and so we get the spectra. And so we can use this to look at stars, galaxies, and understand what they are made of. And that's how we've begun to put together the history of the universe and understood where the elements come from. But we start at the beginning. How does that relate to the elements we find? So we're all familiar with Brian Cox gazing meaningfully into the distance, talking about the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. All matter and time and space erupts into the universe at the same time. Erupt the universe itself erupts into being. It's nothing beforehand. And then moved on since then. So we have that strange period that's called inflation where the universe suddenly expands very dramatically. We get the cosmic microwave background. You have what's called the dark ages when the universe is expanding and cooling and not a lot seems to be going on. You get the first stars appearing. Best estimate now is actually it's about 200 million years after the Big Bang, not 400 million years, but in that sort of period. And then that grows into the structures of the galaxies and the stars that we see today. So Big Bang. First 10 seconds is really weird physics. Um, nothing really makes a lot of sense, certainly not from a chemist's point of view. So we're going to ignore all that. But between 10 seconds and 20 minutes, atoms form. Um, so neutrons form, uh, protons, electrons form, and they start to form atoms. But at this point, they're still ionized. So the nuclei and the electrons are still kind of separated and flying around separately. After 20 minutes, so this is essentially in that period, you've got hydrogen, helium, and a little tiny bit of lithium is formed, and that's it. Everything that we have in the universe now comes from that hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, because after 20 minutes, the universe is already too cool for direct nucleosynthesis. It's too cool for any new elements to form. So when we go on uh, about 100,000 years, you get the first molecules. So those are still at the moment ionized. So that's uh, nuclei of atoms joining together, but the electrons are still stripped off and flying around. 
And that lasts until about 370,000 years when you get neutral atoms formed for the first time and the universe becomes neutral. And that is very, very important because light cannot pass through a plasma. And so 370,000 years, that's the point, it's called the recombination, when the universe becomes transparent. And that's where we see the cosmic microwave background. That's why that's the first light that we can see, because before that light couldn't penetrate. And then 200, 500 million years, first stars and galaxies form, and on we go. One of the really interesting things to realize is that of that available hydrogen and helium that was created in the Big Bang in that first 10 seconds to 20 minutes, only 2% has been converted to other elements in the last 13 billion years. The universe is still overwhelmingly hydrogen and helium. So how do we get these other elements? It connects to the life cycle, life cycle of the stars. And I have always struggled as a chemist with the hertz von russell diagram. I don't find it particularly helpful, um, but I find diagrams like this much more helpful to talk about the creation of stars of different sizes and what happens to them and what happens when they die and what is left over when they die, because that is the route we are going to go to find our elements. And actually, I think this one is even better because it talks about stars forming out of clouds of gas and dust and particles and be either a massive star and go through perhaps through a supernova and even a black hole, a neutron star. But the point is that these stars as they die are releasing material back into the interstellar medium, creating the gas clouds that we can form new stars from. And so you've got a process which is gradually taking that hydrogen and helium in stars creating heavier elements and then those heavier elements being scattered through the universe to go through the cycle again. So the universe is becoming progressively enriched with more and more of the heavier elements. So if there are any astrophysicists amongst you, um, you will know that astrophysicists like to simplify the periodic table. They basically treat anything which is not hydrogen and helium as a metal. So when people are talking about how metallic a star is, they don't actually mean metals the way a chemist mean metals, they just mean it's not hydrogen and helium. So we have the universe filled with hydrogen and helium. You've got slow gravitational collapse until the pressure takes the hydrogen to a temperature at which fusion can ignite. And that's about 4 million degrees. When stars ignite, they often splutter into life and you get jets from a, a, a collapsing rotating disk, which approaches forming a protostar. So this object is called Herbig Harrow 24. It's in the Orion molecular gas cloud. And you can see these jets coming out from a star, which is just in the very, very early days, just lighting off. Now in the early universe, stars were very, very big, typically, you know, anything up to 100 times the size of the sun, burned through their hydrogen and helium extremely quickly, and then exploded. And there are very few of those left. They're called the population three stars. Um, and people are looking for them like sort of stellar archaeology, you know, looking deep into space with the Hubble Space Telescope. How far back can you go? Can we find evidence of these? Because these were the first stars that started the whole thing off. If we take a more typical large star today, something like 15 solar masses, then it will burn hydrogen to helium at a temperature of about 4 million degrees, and it will carry on happily doing that for 20 million years. Once it's burned through most of its hydrogen, the internal pressure from the, the, the nuclear reactions which are going on, which is holding up the gravity. So, all stars are a fight between gravity trying to collapse them and the nuclear processes inside creating energy which is pushing out. So the star will sit stably for a long period with a certain size at a certain temperature until it starts to run out of hydrogen fuel, at which point it starts to collapse under its own gravity. That pushes the temperature up again. And at about 100 million degrees, you can start fusing helium to carbon and oxygen. And a star will typically spend a few million years doing that. 
Same thing happens, you start to deplete the helium, star collapses further, temperature goes up again. And when you reach about 6 million, 600 million degrees, you can convert carbon into oxygen, neon, and magnesium. And a star will do that for a thousand years. And you may have noticed that the time is getting shorter because the nuclear reactions have to happen more ferociously to withstand that pressure to keep the temperature. Um, oxygen at about 2 billion degrees will go to silicon and sulfur, and that can only take weeks. Silicon at 3 billion degrees can be fused to uh, iron, and it, that process will only last days. And that's where it stops, because by the time you've used this process of crushing things down, increasing the temperature by gravity, pushing the temperature up, creating these nuclear reactions, you reach iron, and iron can fuse, but it doesn't give out enough energy to balance things. It's kind of, it's an energy, it's not an energy positive process, it's an energy negative process, it needs energy. So what happens when you reach that point is you've got a star like this, you've got onion layers, you've got a core which can't fuse any further because fusion now consumes rather than releasing energy. And you've got these layers of other materials in which the nuclear reactions are still going on. Now, the energy from the core cannot hold up the outer layers anymore. Gravity just takes over. And you get a sudden core collapse. In about one second, the outer layers collapse in on the core and then rebound in a stupendous explosion. Temperatures of 100 billion degrees. Hurling material out, leaving behind a neutron star. You know, perhaps about one, one and a half solar masses, 20 kilometers across. And that's a type two core collapse supernova. And that is hurling these materials which have been synthesized, all these different elements up to iron being thrown out into the surrounding medium, going to gas clouds to potentially form new stars. The neutron star is formed because of something called ne neutron degeneracy, which says that if you crush matter enough, then eventually everything converts to neutrons the electrons and protons recombine to form neutrons, and then you cannot push it down any further. It cannot get any smaller or any hotter. And so you end up with a neutron star. And this is Cassiopeia A, in the, uh, seen in the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This is a type two supernova, throwing material out into the universe to seed the next generation of stars. And helpfully, using the X-rays, they have sort of tagged the different elements. So the red here is silicon, the yellow is sulfur, the green is calcium, the purple is iron, and the blue represents the blast front coming out from this supernova. So these immense explosions are seeding the next generation of stars with more of the heavier elements so they can go through the same process. The, um, a solar mass star is somewhat more boring. Uh, so same thing, you can go hydrogen to helium at about 4 million degrees, but a star will sit there doing that for 10 billion years, perfectly happily. That's what our star is probably going to do about halfway through its life at the moment. Um, and then same process, helium can be converted to carbon and oxygen, 100 million degrees, 100 million years doing that, but then there just isn't enough mass to raise the temperature any further. So what happens then is the outer layers of that star expand and gently ejects material into its surroundings. So instead of having a stupendous explosion, you have pulses and puffs of matter being thrown off from a red giant. And that leaves behind a white dwarf, and the white dwarf is held up by electron degeneracy, not by neutron degeneracy. So there's not enough mass, not enough gravity to force electrons and protons to recombine. But there is a kind of barrier. You can't get too small because the electrons don't like to be too close together. And this is a planetary nebula showing pulses of material being ejected in, in shells. This is uh, the cat's eye nebula in Draco very beautiful thing. And that's probably what our sun is going to do. And it leaves behind a white dwarf 
that gently, slowly cools and fades. There is actually another process which is very important. A white dwarf could be, have a companion star. It could be part of a binary pair. And that white dwarf can pull materials from its companion, which might be a red giant or another white dwarf. And there's something called the Chandrasekhar mass limit of 1.4 solar masses. So we've got this white dwarf held up by uh, this electron degeneracy pressure. It can't get any, any smaller. It's not big enough to go into a neutron star mode, but it's dragging material from its neighbor. And when it reaches about 1.4 solar masses, fusion restarts abruptly. And it lasts a few seconds. The temperature soars and it, the whole star goes supernova and completely destroys itself. At that point, it's giving out maybe 5 billion times as much energy as our sun. And that's a type 1a supernova. And this is the one they use as the long distance standard candle for measuring distances to distant galaxies. So this is how they discovered the dark energy problem, uh, that the universe appears to be expanding faster and faster. It was tracking type 1a supernova. And you can imagine, because they all light off once they reach 1.4 solar masses, and because they all totally destroy themselves, they tend to give out a very similar profile of energy. And that's how you can use them as a solar candle, so, as a standard candle. Anyway, in our story, we've only got as far as iron. So iron is kind of, you know, first row of the transition elements, it's not very far along. In a supernova explosion, we can go a bit further than iron, but it doesn't explain a lot of the periodic table. It simply does not explain where all the heavier elements come from. And the solution to that is a process called neutron capture. And this is a process involving what's called beta decay. So um, a nucleus can be hit with a neutron and can accept a neutron into it. Now a neutron, the number of neutrons doesn't define what an element is, that's the number of protons, it define, but it defines the isotope. And some isotopes are stable and some isotopes are unstable. So an unstable isotope, that added neutron, might convert to a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. And once you've added a proton, you've moved the element to the next one along in the series. And you can see that here. So here, these are elements that are next to each other in the periodic table. So silver, cadmium, indium, uh, tin, and antimony. OK, uh, and this is the number of neutrons along here, silver 109 neutrons. You can add a uh, neutron capture, you can capture a neutron, add a neutron to it, that's unstable, beta decay, and you end up with cadmium. And then you can march up, adding more neutrons to reach another unstable isotope, bang, new proton is created, move over to indium, and so you go. So all you need for this process of climbing the ladder is you need seed atoms from earlier supernova and a source of neutrons. Now, where might you get that? Actually, dying low mass stars. Oops, let's do that. Um, so these are stars on the asymptotic giant branch. You get carbon, can react with helium to produce oxygen 16 plus a neutron and that produces a constant supply. So this is going on in the outer layers of a dying star, a red giant star. You're creating this slow flux of neutrons. And with that, you can do this process of climbing the ladder and building heavier and heavier elements. The limit of this turns out to be element 83, bismuth. Because if you try and go beyond bismuth, there's no stable isotope. It just, it just falls apart before it can actually do this beta decay process. So we can get as far as bismuth using this process it's called the slow neutron capture process. But there is another process which is so bizarre, I find it just, just hard to imagine, which produces the even heavier elements. 
So this is the LIGO interferometer at Hanford in Washington State. So it's an interferometer for looking for gravity waves. This was the device along with others in other parts of the globe that identified the, uh, the gravity waves, first of all. It's got two arms at right angles. They're each four kilometers long. And you send laser light down each arm, bounce it back and recombine it. And the idea is that you can see if the length of the arms is shifting, if the length of one arm is shifting relative to another. So if a gravity wave comes through, it would tend to lengthen one arm and compress the other one. These devices can measure a difference in length between those two four kilometers arms of one ten thousandth the width of a proton. So that's 10 to the minus 19 of a meter. It's an astonishing accuracy. And you can imagine with all the other stuff going on, um, not only to, to isolate it, but you had to, to get rid of all the noise and pick out that signal. It's quite remarkable. In fact, four kilometers is nowhere near long enough. Those laser beams are actually bounced up and down each arm 300 times before they recombine to get a long enough distance uh, for the laser beam to be affected by the gravity wave, to be able to create even that distance, one ten thousandth the width of a proton. And I sometimes think that we forget just how remarkably precise astronomy is, even in our amateur astronomy. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, but I would reckon if I was doing astrophotography with a reasonable mount and, and the seeing wasn't too bad, I would hope to get an RMS uh, error in my guiding of perhaps uh, half uh, an arc second. Um, you know, with excursions, little pulses out to maybe one, one and a half, but spending most time RMS around half an arc second. That would be that would be pretty good guiding. If I was standing on one goal line of a rugby pitch, and somebody was standing at the other log. Gold line, gold line, holding up an ordinary dressmaker's pin, that dressmaker's pin would subtend an angle of about one arc second. So that means this bit of consumer electronics that I bought is capable of accurately tracking to better than the width of that pin at 100 meters. And that's just our amateur kit. This kind of stuff is, is another level altogether. So. What is the relationship between being able to detect gravity waves and the creation of the really heavy elements? Well, in a process that is just astonishing, if two neutron stars merge, as we have seen with a gravity wave detection, or a neutron star and a black hole merge, the energy released is so enormous that you can this is called rapid, it releases immense intensities of neutrons captured by all the material nearby. And that can produce elements up to, up to 250 and beyond. And all of those are unstable and they collapse back down very rapidly to the ones that we observe. It rips the starts apart and it just destroys everything. Okay, that's where we get the heavy elements from, but where do all these close pairs binary pairs of neutron stars come from? Well, it turns out that in the early universe, where we have this big generation of, of very hot, very fast burning stars, it was quite common. The creation of protostars from the gas clouds would often produce two, three, four stars very close to each other, burning hydrogen like crazy, going supernova and all the rest of it. And so actually in the early universe, we fairly common to see two neutron stars in a binary orbit. And when they come together, they can produce this immense pulse of energy, which can create these very heavy elements. What about other intense phenomena uh, that we might see? So galactic jets, hypernova, accretion disks around black holes. They don't seem to add much to the story. You need neutrons to get beyond the iron peak. Uh, that's the really important thing. So it's only those processes which create neutrons which make a difference. Cosmic rays, um, so helium nuclei going through the, galaxy, the universe at that speed of light, they can actually break apart elements 
uh, if they hit them, uh, a process called cosmic spallation, and they just break fragments off. And that some elements can be created from that. But most of the really dramatic things we see, like these, you know, galactic jets and all the rest of it, big radio areas, not really doing the job. It's these slow death. It's supernova, first of all, then it's a slow death of red giants, and then it's these amazing neutron, neutron star mergers, neutron black hole star mergers. And so back to the Hubble extreme field. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at this process of progressively enriching the universe with heavier and heavy elements, which end up landing on Earth, being part of the formation of our solar system, still arriving through meteorites, and creating the material out of which we build our world. We would have, without all these processes going on, we wouldn't have mobile phones, we wouldn't have electricity, we wouldn't have automobiles, we wouldn't exist. And this is the current best guess of the evolving composition of the universe. So in black there, you have hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, that's a big bag fusion. Exploding massive stars producing these elements here, white dwarfs also producing these materials, dying low mass stars going heavier and heavier, and then these merging neutron stars here. And then there's a couple here which tend to be created by this cosmic ray spallation process. Process. So that's where the elements come from. Let's take the famous quote from Carl Sagan. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And I, found, I find that such a beautiful image and such a fascinating topic. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Fascinating talk. So have we got any questions? If you could send them through the via the chat option, please. Got uh, one to kick off with. Um, what is the, uh, or is there a criteria for adding new um, elements to the periodic table? For example, you, you, you mentioned Noganissium has only got five or perhaps six atoms. Yeah. Is it, is it, does it need three or more atoms or? Uh, it's um, not terribly well defined. For... Yeah, it's not, not terribly well defined because we're dealing with extremely unstable materials. Um, but the, the, the 2016 was when the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry admitted organesson to the periodic table. And, uh, you know, it's one of these complex uh, international debate processes, but they finally agreed that, yes, there was enough evidence for that one. They, they believed it. Uh, it did seem to be there. And it was admitted to the periodic table and it was given a name, Organesson, which actually, um, I think it's the first element that honors uh, a scientist who was still alive at the time that it was elected to the periodic table. Um, so that's the was done at the, what's called the Joint Research Center north of, of Moscow at Dubna, and that's one of the two places in the world. The other one is the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in California, which actually uh, use this process of very carefully slamming heavy nuclei together in an accelerator and hoping that they will stick and not smash apart and they can create these heavy elements. And but pretty much all of those materials of those, you know, beyond element 94, um, plutonium and, uh, was, was a, an earlier one, but most of the later ones uh, were made in one of those two locations, either at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory or at the Joint Research Center at Dubna. All right, the next uh, question then is, um, we've got the two, Oddment groups, the lanthanides and the actinides. Yeah. Um, why uh, are they different from, and why don't they fit into one of the other groups? Okay. Um, right. So to say, going back through the slideshow and, and showing it all again, remember the periodic table. You've got, you've got sort of pillars, and they get smaller as they come into the center. Now, what that is reflecting is the 
orbitals, the electron orbitals, which are needed for the number of electrons you've got. So the first two columns of the periodic table, the one with hydrogen at the top, um, use what are called S orbitals. And the, each orbital can hold two electrons. So as you get more and more complicated, you're building shells of these S orbitals and you're filling in up to two electrons. Then come the, uh, the P orbitals, which actually hold six electrons. And they're where most of the non-metals lie over on the right-hand side. Then in the middle, you have the D orbitals, which hold 10 electrons. And that's that what are called the transition group. That's where all your normal metals are, your iron, your copper, your cobalt, all those things, they're in that kind of middle slice. As you keep adding electrons, the quantum mechanics says you need more and more complicated orbitals. And so a certain number of protons and electrons, then you actually have the F orbitals come into play and they hold 14 electrons. And that's the, that group, the, old, the lanthanides and the actinides. Those are the ones where you have the outer electrons are sitting in the F orbitals. And so you build up, you start off with, with 1s, 2s, 2p, and it, it sort of builds up and then you get 3d. And as you are adding more and more protons and electrons, you need more and more orbitals and they become more complicated. The theory was that if you could get past the f orbitals back to the p orbitals uh, uh, again, all the way through the d orbitals, to the p orbitals in that right hand block, then you would hit an island of stability. And you would start to create elements which have a long life, even though they were super heavy. Um, but it hasn't worked out. Uh, so we've made a number of them. Those are those ones at the end, uh, like Organesson and, and some of the more recent ones, uh, and they're not stable. So a bit of head scratching, a uh, bit of smirking from the physicists who tend to say, we told you so. Um, but there's still a hope that somewhere out there, there is an island of stability, and they don't just get more and more unstable as time goes on. Right, next one from Steve. Any truth in the idea that elements are destroyed in a supernova and then reform afterwards? Um, basically, no. The energies in a supernova, um, there, there will be nuclear processes going on. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to strip all the electrons off. Um, but the energy involved because you've got to, it's not about heating a nucleus, you've got to hit it with something in order for it to change. And so it's back to the thing about needing those neutron sources. So an ordinary supernova just blasts material out. It may break up, you know, damage a few of them, it will strip the electrons off, it will ionize them, it will make hot gas, but it won't change the nuclei. Right. So, yeah, in general, I would say no. When a new supernova happens, type two supernova, it is throwing out calcium, sulfur, iron into the surroundings. Yeah, things that's already made and that are already in existence. Yeah, yeah. they're made in the star and then the star explodes and throws them out. I think somebody ran away with the idea that the explosion and the energy is so huge, it just destroys everything and everything has to reform. But that's not no. the case, as you have no. well described. Thanks for a superb talk, by the way. Really, very, Thank very you. good. Right, the next one um, from Olaf, who's our resident chemist. Uh, <laughs> do the relative abundances of post, now I'm assuming it's BI, is that bismuth? Bismuth, elements? yeah. Compared to one another and to lighter elements agree with the theories of their formation? Um, I think the answer is I don't know. Uh, because the theories of their formation were constructed to explain the abundances that were observed. Right? I mean, <laughs> you, you've got what you've got. But I mean, there, yes. I mean, the, the nuclear physicists can look at this and say, OK, we can do that slow neutron capture process. We know the capture cross sections. We know how often beta decay happens. You know, and yes, it all makes sense. So to that level, it, it does. But of course, some of the numbers were obtained by looking at those abundances and what was going on. So it's a slightly circular argument. I think the, um, 
the interesting one is this neutron neutron star merger, which is producing such an overwhelming dose of neutrons that you know the cr capture cross sections. The first thing it's doing is it's overwhelming the, the beta decay process. That's how you get beyond bismuth is overwhelming the beta decay process. Things happening so fast that the mm. that you know that it doesn't have time to decay before it's been hit by another neutron. Something else is happening. So um, yeah, I. I I think it does make sense, but I, I wouldn't like to put my hand on my heart and swear to it, because I do know that some of the numbers came out of looking at the actual observed abundances. Thank you, it was a really brilliant talk. Thank you. Right, the next one from George. Fantastic talk, thanks. And his question is, why do the outer layers of a normal star puff up to produce a red giant late in its life and not during the early part of its life? So in the early part of its life, you've got a stable nuclear process going on at the heart of the star. So everything's in balance. Um, and so you are, you, you, you've got these nuclear processes going on in the heart of the star, pushing out energy, and that is balancing the gravitational force. Star runs out of fuel, starts to go to helium, star contracts. When you start to run out of helium, there's nothing to, there's not enough mass to force further compression. There's still quite a lot of energy around because there's still fusion going on and it starts to swell. It starts to expand the outer layers. So the photon energy and the particle energy still being generated in the center is pushing out. So these are not dead yet. You know, they are, they are dying, but they are not yet dead. There's still plenty of nuclear processes going on. And basically, the nuclear process at that point, things like the, these, these nuclear cycle, sorry, neutron cycles that are going on in the outer layers, these start to just push things out. The other thing is you get, you get a lot of convection. So it doesn't happen early in the star's life because the gravity is holding everything tight. You start to get a lot more convection. And all of that is just gradually pushing things out. And often it happens in pulses, which is why you get some get planetary nebula that show that. Particularly again, if there's a way, so a star can have kind of, a, it can be stable for a thousand years at a particular sort of situation. And then there's a change, maybe increase energy within the core and it sort of blasts some material out and reaches a new equilibrium. And so it stabilizes again. And actually that's how, when you have a nova rather than a supernova, that's kind of one of these processes. Of, of stellar indigestion. That is not a terribly good answer, but it's the best I have. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. Um, I don't have any more um, questions, so bring Andy back into the frame. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. There's There's been a question that's bugging me. Um, we know that, um, normal matter makes up a tiny fraction of the universe, don't we? So what about dark matter? What sort of elements are abundant in dark matter? What do we know well, about it? Well, we, we don't even know what dark matter is. You will observe that I completely sidestep the issue of dark matter on the grounds that it doesn't show up in the periodic table. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we don't even know what it is yet. What does seem to be the case, um, is that dark matter is important in the formation of that very first generation of stars, which are bizarrely called population three stars. So the ones that were made in the very early universe, purely out of hydrogen and helium and nothing else in them. And the dark matter seems to be very important in creating the clumps of gas. So, so after you've got through the um, recombination period, the universe is transparent to light, uh, cosmic microwave background starts to move around the universe continues to expand and cool down. It actually gets pretty cold. In fact, the latest evidence from an experiment called EDGES says that it got way too cool for our current physics to explain. And then suddenly stars happened. And the thinking is that there may be an interaction between the dark matter, between strands of dark matter that were gradually causing the clumps of gas to form 
which then, so taking those initial kind of instabilities that you can see in the cosmic microwave background, the dark matter was influential in causing those to form clumps of gas, which then became protostars and protogalaxies. So it's important, and it's clearly important to explaining why the universe is the way we look at it. But, but as far as I know, we have no idea what it is. It doesn't seem to be anything that, you know, weakly interactive massive particles. It's just dodging the issue. <laughs> Yes, one day we'll find out about it. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. The, the uh, negative numbers on the periodic table. Yeah, 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 that's right. We'll start with minus one and we'll go up to minus 118 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Richard, for your time. And yeah, you described uh, quite a complicated uh, subject and you explained it well for us. It is very clearly um described yeah we broke down the, the subject well of course well i understood it well anyway so i hope we understood as well well thank you very much for your time and for your attention it was a great pleasure to talk to you uh, you may have guessed i'm slightly passionate about this subject <laughs> yes yes well it's great it's great to have a passion isn't it it's great to have a passion yeah thank you richard anyway um but, so what we normally do um if we have like a normal physical lecture with a speaker, we normally have a cup of tea and a few biscuits and a chat and that afterwards, we, we have to provide our own tea and coffee. And, but so, uh, you know, we just have an informal chat afterwards. So you're welcome to, to, to stay on if you want the chat. Or yeah, I mean, if anybody, you know, wants to pick up any other topics, um, the last, uh, I will tell you in advance, the last time I gave this talk, someone asked me, you know, the onion shell model of a star that's about to go supernova, what is the thickness of each layer? <laughs> um, and I couldn't answer that question. I've looked since and I still can't find the answer to that question. So. <laughs> but I'll hang on for a while if anybody wants to chat further. Yeah, okay. So shall we unmute everybody, Paul? Well, I can't do it. Yeah, people have to unmute themselves, but okay. they're quite welcome to. Here you go. Hi there. Hi there. All right. Have you got a question you'd like to ask? I haven't thought of one, no. <laughs> if it does, I will go ahead with it. <laughs> So I, I forgot to mention that um, although I was born in London uh, and grew up there and therefore had very restricted skies, the one place I could be sure of fairly dark skies was close to where you guys are because um, my father was born and bred uh, around Ike and Rendlesham and uh, my grandmother lived there until her death and so we were fairly regular visitors to that part of the world. And um, yeah, that, those were slightly better skies, uh, you know, around Woodbridge and, and near the Bentwaters Air Base and things like that. So there I did see some more stars. That was my first glimpse of the Milky Way. Well, when you come down next time, you're more than welcome to come to World Park. I'm looking forward to it. I'm admiring that piece of kit behind you. That's that's the uh, that's the, the telescope, is it? That's the natural telescope. It's Oh, the tube is roughly about 13 foot long. Yeah. Meters. I mean, that that is, a, as I said earlier on, that is a serious piece of kit. It's um, serious. I mean, it's interesting that still today, if, if you have astronomy on television, it is much more likely to show something like that than it is any telescope that anybody's actually using these days. It still, it still screams telescope to everybody, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It is a proper telescope, but functional it's kind of um had its day nearly mm. <laughs> well paul wouldn't say that because he spends most of the time doing kind of um <laughs> visits with it <laughs> but presumably the optics are good it's it's the mounting that's the problem the mount is pretty good the, it's mount, the other way around <laughs> all right way around, yes <laughs> yes yeah. yeah i suppose um, um it's a it's a fairly fairly big is it a doublet or a, or a double it yes yeah. yeah it's it's a it's a it's a good make it's a mertz lens 
but it wasn't one of their best. It was either a, a Monday morning or a Friday afternoon job. <laughs> Indeed. So what kind of telescopes do you, I mean, you know, apart from when you are showing people around and playing with, with that beast, what kind of telescopes are you guys using? What's popular? We've, we've got all our members have got a whole range of mm. uh, telescopes. I mean, uh, there's quite a few astro images in the society. They're um, they different levels of astrophotography, lunar and planetary and deep sky stuff. So mm. when I do wide field, wide field uh, deep sky stuff with a, uh, a short focal length refractor. Um, we've got lunar and planetary images. Right. Um, so what's it been like for you? I mean, you know, on the west side of the country, it has been dire. I think I've had two nights of imaging since Christmas. It's uh, not been a lot better uh, over here because we had, two weeks ago, we had quite a bit of snow. And before that, we had about three months of rain. So, yeah, the uh, imaging opportunities have been few and far between. I mean... I think myself, I'd done a bit of deep sky imaging at the end of September, 